morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming along to this, uh, this session this morning. Um, as you can see, my name is Fraser Dean. I represent a company called Video. Um, we are a, a new company to the video conferencing world. Um, I've been given strict instructions this afternoon or this morning that although we are a vendor, not to give you any product pitches, which is what I'm not going to do, um, but I have worked in the video conferencing industry now for 17 years. Um, what I'd like to do this morning is just share with you some of the things and the knowledge that I've picked up over the years of what we've seen that has worked, what hasn't worked, what we're seeing is kind of industry trends and where we believe this whole industry is moving over the next couple of years and hopefully give you some information and some thoughts and ideas about what you need to perhaps start to think about to, uh, to make best use of those, uh, those changes. Um, I've got about 12 to 15 slides, so it should take us about sort of 20 minutes to get through those. What I would like to do at the end is to try and engage in this workshop and try and get some of your feedback as well, which is critical for us as a manufacturer. We'd like to understand you know, some of the, you know, the, the things that you're experiencing, the good things in your company regarding video, um, things that haven't worked, and then we can perhaps have a debate about that. Okay? <coughs> so. Isn't video conferencing just absolutely fantastic and brilliant? You know, it's so affordable today. You walk through your meeting, through your offices, every meeting room is equipped with HD screens, HD cameras. All the rooms are fully occupied with people engaged in video calls. You walk through your open plan offices, you see people on their desktop PCs engaged in video conferencing. And it's just the most natural an immersive experience that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, right? <laughs> Boom. <laughs> right, exactly. And we're going to cover some of those reasons why we feel that it isn't quite as joyful as it should be. And it's amazing, you know, there's been these four, I guess, reasons why people implement video conferencing and they get so kind of engrossed about the increased productivity that we can do it's going to reduce our travel costs oh and we can also be carbon neutral that's going to be great we can put that up on our websites and you know we'll get a few extra brownie points there but you know what it's just not quite like that is it um, it isn't really affordable not that what we see today um, it isn't everywhere so let's kind of dig a little bit deeper and perhaps understand you know, why it isn't uh, as so joyful as this first page. So you know, a lot of people, kind of including myself up until now, kind of saw this whole video conferencing as the big white elephant. Um, it isn't the most natural of experiences. And you know, how many of you guys have implemented video in your organizations? So pretty much a full house. How many of you use it on a daily basis? Okay. And how many people use it in meeting rooms? Okay, and what about down to the desktop mobile devices? Okay, so we're, we're getting there. Okay, so yeah, I've been in the video industry for 17 years. I've worked for a couple of different manufacturers over the years. And for me personally, I never really used video conferencing on a daily basis because I just really didn't feel that the the experience was was natural and there isn't you know I mean we can be in a meeting room you know we can be four or five people and we'll be engaged in conversation around that table but you'll be aware that somebody else has joined you on video and it's a real challenge to try and engage and connect with that person remotely and for the poor chap who's external you know, trying to join and be part of your meeting, it, it is a real challenge. And you know, a lot of the people that we've spoken to as well, they're doing things with the design of their meeting rooms to try and make the engagement more natural and immersive. But you know, there's this whole big sort of quality issue as well, you know, particularly when people walk in. And you know, as companies I've worked for in the past, they've spent you know, hundreds of thousands just on one meeting room. You know, they put in the big projectors, the large screens, high definition cameras, you know, two at the front, one at the back. But the video quality <coughs> is still kind of a bit questionable, you know, and they expect it to be, when they see these types of rooms, they expect it to be like broadcast TV. 
And then a lot of times, you know, the, those expectations aren't met. So right from the beginning, you know, people are kind of, mm, it's not really what I was expecting and it's not really engaging me that well. Um, and it isn't really particularly <coughs> widely accessible. Not when you start to look at how much it does cost to video enable these meeting rooms, the cost of the infrastructure, the cost of the networks as well to run it on. So a lot of, of organizations, they understand the reasons why they need to implement video conferencing, but because of the cost, perhaps don't deploy it on a, on a wide scale. So you know, most people who want to use it probably can't because the limited resources are all booked or if they're in joint meeting rooms, there could be another meeting that's taking place in that meeting room, so therefore you can't get access to the, the, the video conferencing equipment. The other issue that we see as well is that it, it's siloed. You know, video conferencing today has been a great tool for a company to implement internally, and it's a great tool for them to be able to talk to their colleagues in the States or wherever they may be. But it's a big challenge today to actually go on a video call with one of your suppliers or one of your customers. There's a whole bunch of technical things that need to take place, neighboring gatekeepers and networks, firewall traversal. So it's cost again <coughs> on the technology to do that, the people to manage it, and it's just not <coughs> kind of easy for the users to pick up the remote and go, right, I want to call so-and-so from company X, Y, and Z. So there's a couple of reasons why we kind of believe that the situation exists today. The first thing is that you know, video conferencing is never ever designed to run on an IP network. So if we wind the clock back over the years, I think it was some top 25 years ago, the first video conferencing systems were being deployed, you know, the likes of CLI and GPT, and these were for leased line circuits. So the coding and transportation mechanisms that were designed were based on the assumption that there's always going to be a fixed amount of bandwidth and the quality of that bandwidth is going to be relatively constant. So there's been the evolution, we've gone from our lease line networks and we moved over to our ISDN networks, but the same principles apply. You know, when you establish a call, you've got that fixed bandwidth, whether it's 384, 768, it's yours, and again, the quality of those connections are relatively constant. So the coding that's been deployed today is based on those assumptions. Okay, we've gone through some improvements. So the coding for video, we've gone through better compression algorithms. So we've gone from 261 to 263 to 264. So we can pack a lot more data down the available bandwidth. But how those devices compensate for errors is a bit of a challenge. So when we see video conferencing being deployed today in the enterprise, to compensate for the fact that they were never designed to run on IP networks, you have to put them onto an MPLS network. So there's additional cost for that MPLS network to give you the guarantee of the bandwidth and to give you that guarantee that you're never going to get any more than 1% packet loss. So extra cost, extra hassle, but it still restricts it because you're now restricting that video conferencing deployment to that MPLS network. It's a challenge then to start extending it to our remote workforces who happen to be working from home or are traveling and using a wireless network in a hotel. And you know, we see this poor performance um, when we kind of go off the, uh, the MPLS network. And we have kind of conversations with people who are kind of looking at um, deploying Microsoft Link as an example. And it works reasonably well in that office environment on that controlled network. <coughs> but as soon as they then go off their network and they're working from home, then they're at the perils of the internet where they've got fluctuations of bandwidth and high degrees of packet loss. And we get to that all too familiar image of you know, the pixelated screen and you can just about work out who it is and typically then people just minimize the video window and then just use the audio channel for the communication. Um, we kind of touched a little bit on the, the, the infrastructure costs, but the other big issue that you've got is the actual video bridging costs itself. So, you know, we can pay for our room systems to video enable our meeting rooms, we can pay for our MPLS network, but to bridge all of these devices together requires a device called an MCU or a bridge. And the average price per port of a bridge is between six and eight thousand pounds a port. So, fine, are we going to put that level of infrastructure in at that price per port 
to support 10,000 desktop users. Yeah.